Oh, we thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, you're so good. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of every song that we sing. Oh, God, you're good. Do you feel the power of God here right now? Oh, God, I love you. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, you're good. I love you, Lord. For some in this place, it's very easy to sing this song because they can look back on the times when God has been faithful. And they can even bring them to this moment in this church where He has not been unfaithful. But He follows us to this point today and He shows His worth day in and day out. There are those that can sing this song easily. Then there are those that have a hard time. And it's not because He's unfaithful, but it's so often because we're ashamed. And we haven't made ourselves holy and righteous before Him. And I pray that if you have a hard time singing of the goodness of God, that will change today. We have an opportunity today to, to, to flip all of this over. And you can leave here differently. You can leave here differently. Can we just pray right now? God, we love you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for what you're doing right now. We, we thank you not just for the songs that we sing, but the presence that was ushered in here by those that are willing to worship, lift their hands and raise their voices, God. We thank you for your presence and your, 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 your unfaltering love for us, God. You are faithful. You are faithful, Lord. God, we ask that you bless the remaining of the service. Whatever is to come, whatever will happen from this moment forward, we ask that you move and you work. We honor you, Jesus. We love you today. He is faithful and he's just. He's faithful to, to forgive. He's faithful to renew. He's faithful. He's faithful. Thank you, musicians, singers. Thank you so much. God is so good. That, that, that simple little sentence, God is so good. It still cannot express how good He really is. And at what point does good go to, from good to great? And what point does great go beyond our human limitations when we say someone's a great football player? We can't, there is no word to describe the goodness of God. So it has to go beyond our lips and into our heart to where we're at now. Oh, God is so good. You may be seated. I'm, I'm not going to bring us a scripture right away today. I, uh, I'm just thankful. Are you just thankful to be in a place where you're loved? Amen. A place where you can see brothers and sisters that, that love God and they, where you can worship together. And I'm, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for Jaden bringing me a bottle of water earlier because I was needing it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, God is good. So life that I'm going to talk about today, life is full of give and take. Think about when you realize that. How old were you when you realized you can't hold on to something and also bring something else to you? No one learns this better than a newlywed couple, and I hate to pick on the newlyweds because Caleb got picked on earlier by Pastor, wherever he went. Uh, he was singing, but uh, well, well, Harrison, there we go. I had to pick on him then. We, no one realizes the give and take more than a newlywed, right, Shy? There we go. No one realizes this more because when you come back from the honeymoon, the honeymoon season is over, and you realize a week or two or three later when you finally have to do laundry, one of you folds laundry different than the other. <laughs> Anybody understand? There we go. Uh, one of you, you don't do the same things. Your value system is completely different, and you don't realize this when you got married. And so you have to give and take. Your spending habits change, and, and what is a necessity? Well, to Harrison, a necessity is one thing. To Shai, you don't need that. <laughs> or at least that's how we were. Olivia, uh, my wife, wonderful drum player today. Yeah. Amen. Uh, you learn all these things, and you, you learn that there's this give and take process, and I'm trying to teach my daughter 
she's five years old, just turned five, and, and she's learning the difference between a $1 bill and a $100 bill. There's a big difference to all the adults in the room, right? There's a, but to a child who's two, three years old, they, they see the money and that's a lot of, you can give them a hundred pennies, they'd be even more happier. Right. Take away the hundred dollar bill, give them the pennies, they're thrilled. Yep. Yep. Birthdays are a lot easier at that point. The, the name brand of shoes don't really matter. Right. Uh, all those things kind of just downplay because the value system is completely different. Right. And so giving and taking go hand in hand. Uh, adults that have been married a while, maybe you've got a lot of kids, and I know the Goodmans used to go through a lot of milk. When you go to the grocery store, you go in and you cannot leave with a, grocery, a basket full of groceries unless you do what? You pay. You, you give them something so that you can walk out with what you see is valuable. It's worth my dollar. It's worth what I work for. It's worth my hour of work that's been transferred into a dollar that's being transferred into milk and bread. This transfer, this exchange of goods and, and services and time and all that's happening everywhere we look. You have made an exchange today just to be here. Yep. You woke up a little bit earlier and you gave of your time so that you could come early to church so that our Sunday school teachers could study maybe last night, earlier this week, prepare to teach our children. You gave of something right. so you could take something right. else. I was instantly reminded and thinking through this process of an old commercial. And maybe some of you could picture this in your mind as well. But the question is, what would you do for a Klondike bar? <laughs> that, it's been going on forever, yeah. those commercials. And the, the, the greatest one I, I remember seeing, I, I looked it up yesterday, is uh, what would you do for a Klondike bar? And the guys on the, on the high, on the, in New York City maybe on the sidewalk, and they said, would you dress up like a clown? And, and he said, absolutely not, but would you do it for a Klondike bar? <laughs> and they start putting it in his nose, and they, they say, it's chocolate-covered ice cream made perfect for you. And they, 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 they talk it up, and he says, where's the nose? Give it to me. Where's the hat? And he starts throwing it on. He said, whatever it takes. And he takes the Klondike bar. What would you do? And this commercials, and they, they, they had one that where the husband walks into the kitchen. He's holding a glass. What would you do for a Klondike bar? And he walks to the dishwasher. And he opens it up, and he sets it in the dishwasher. What would you do for, for a Klondike bar? And he's, he's willing to give up some of his previous self just so he could take whatever it is. And I have never even had a Klondike bar, but I guess it wasn't. <laughs> All the 80s kids are dying, apparently. <laughs> but what would you do for a Klondike bar? So these commercials... <laughs> There's an exchange, and you can go ahead and put my title up, but, but today I'm talking about the greatest exchange, the greatest exchange. Uh, we're talking about exchanges, uh, anybody into cryptocurrency exchanges, you're starting to learn about it, and you're like, hey, these kids are um, making money with this thing, maybe I should learn a thing or two, uh, and, and I, I was like, man, there's, there's some crazy stories about crypto, and some of you older in the, in the church maybe don't know Crypto is not just like a kryptonite or, or, or something in the sci-fi movie, but this is an actual currency that you can't touch. Yep. Yep. That, that's all online, and you, you, you may never see it. It's only represented by a picture and a number. And uh, in 2021, Tesla announced that they're going to use Dogecoin to sell their vehicles, to sell different things. They're not even going to use the U.S. dollar. There's this exchange that they put a value on something you can't touch, a certain dollar amount on, on this thing, but you could buy a car with it. And not just any car, but a Tesla. Yep. In 2013, a police chief decided he would change his salary from the U.S. dollar to the Bitcoin. In 2013. Yep. So those of you that know, you're like, wow. Yep. The average salary back then for him was probably 50-something thousand dollars, and, Tesla, and, and Bitcoin was valued at about a thousand dollars. Today, that Bitcoin, same Bitcoin, is valued at $41,000. Just a few years ago, a few years have passed, and I think he made a wise move, but kind of reckless at the same time. Because there was all speculation on whether there's value in this digital currency and whether the exchange would actually work out and would it make it to your account and what would happen if you lose the code, the key to, to the crypto. Yep. There's a lot of questions to be asked, and it's a lot easier to say, I can hide that money under my pillow. There's a difference. 
But he valued something a little differently. And uh, in 2012, there was a man who accidentally threw away a hard drive with 7,500 Bitcoin on it. And it's yet to be found in the landfill because the landfill wouldn't let him get in there. And he's offered, I'll give 25% to charity if you just let me go in with a crew. It's still there, apparently. So we have these exchanges. For me, I have a slight addiction to uh, uh, Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist. <laughs> I, I love, like, when, I'm, when I'm bored, I just scroll. And, 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 and then I message them. Even though I, don't, I can't afford to buy the car, I'll still message them and ask questions about it. I know it annoys them. But I got lots of questions. <laughs> and... And my wife, she's probably just shaking her head. I don't know where she's at. But it's, I don't know. I just want to know. I, I love the interesting aspects of all these things that are always for sale that could just be right next door to me. And you never know what kind of deals you come up on because there's always an opportunity for an exchange. I, I've seen things in the backgrounds of people's pictures. They're selling a trailer, but I see a four-wheeler. <laughs> Anybody else done that? How much for the full wheel? <laughs> I'll give you ten dollars. I, I, I've made offers that were low baller, just met, never made sense. But there's been times where I've won. It's the craziest thing. I, I was sharing with Colt here or somebody the other day how I've cre- found some crazy deals. Yep, yep, yep. I, I, I got, Daniel went with me last year. We picked up a free truck. We traded a scooter that I got for free, and I traded that for a truck, and now I still have a truck. I uh, got a free boat one time, and uh, yeah, it caught on fire. Uh, it, it, it was not a good, it didn't turn out good, and uh, I, I was working on it, about to take it to the lake, and you know, it just started cranking up, an old boat, it started smoking. It was no good, and uh, so free boat, Hurricane Harvey uh, sank it in the driveway, uh, it literally filled with water, bent the entire trailer. Uh, it was not a free boat, and uh, <laughs> So it, it was huge. It was like a 16-person catamaran dr- bayliner dreamboat. I, I had that given to me. And uh, I had all these experiences of, of free things and, and things I've got for a really good deal. And I enjoyed buying and selling things and making exchanges, whether that be conversationally, whether that be trading money for an object or an object for another object. I've traded cars multiple times just because I needed a better fuel economy and I didn't have the money and I'd rather trade vehicles. And people do that thing. And uh, one time I had this garage sale. I I was a youth pastor in Lufkin. I had a garage sale and I wanted to make money for the youth group. And we put on a garage sale and we let everybody know that we're accepting junk. Be very careful when you say that. Uh, You will get a lot of junk. And so for for six months or so I planned this garage sale and we had a place to store it. So I would just go and pick things up from people, treadmills, washers and dryers, all kinds of things. And about two weeks before the garage sale was to happen, a person in the church said they had a vacant home that had a bottle collection. A bottle collection. And I, you know, you assume a bottle collection, you know, 10, 20 bottles maybe. And they said, they're, they're probably of some value. Would you like them? I, I have a problem saying no as well. And so I accepted the offer and they said they will deliver it to the church in the church kitchen. Well, I show up and they had unloaded boxes and boxes and crates full of bottles, Avon bottles, Coca-Cola bottles, all the medicine bottles from, from times past, and they're clear and different colors, and, and, and I'm sure they had value. And so I was like, well, there's an opportunity here, right? Because value is in the eye of what? Beholder. The beholder. So beauty is in the, eye of the eye of the beholder. The value is in the eye of the beholder. But I can't just post this thing on Craigslist. I can't just put this in a garage sale and expect it to sell. That would be just idiotic of me. I'd be wasting my time, be terrible. And so I thought, maybe I should join a club, a bottle club. (laughs) So I got on Facebook and I joined this club, and I am now the new owner of the biggest bottle collection in East Texas. And so, uh, it's pretty amazing, right? Wouldn't you love it? Wouldn't you? And and this bottle collection, if you want to put some pictures up, these are not the actual pictures, go to another one. This is basically what it looked like, just different colored bottles, Uh, Coca-Cola, different ones. I found these online just to kind of give you all an idea. It it was like that times 20. It it was huge. And it covered the entire kitchen. Every counter space in the whole kitchen was covered with bottles. 
Where's Olivia at? Do you remember this? Yes. And so she'll never forget. I had all these bottles. And so I decided I'm going to join this club on Facebook because I knew that if I could just put it in the right eyes of somebody that would appreciate them, I could sell them. And sure enough, I, I, I went and I started taking pictures. And I wasn't bragging or anything, but when I started posting these pictures, people were amazed. There were some amazing bottles in there. And there's some weird people that like bottles. It, it was the craziest thing. And uh, I'd never met a bottle collector until this point. And they started messaging me, and, and we started commenting back and forth. And I was getting confused on which bottles they were talking about because there were so many. And every bottle had this unique marker. There's some that on the very bottom had a unique marker. It's kind of like coins with Pastor. He, he understands coins. I was a bottle expert at this point because I had Google. And I would start doing the research, and I had all these people telling me they're, they're worth something. They're worth something. And, and looking at them, whether the intention of the Coca-Cola was out or in or, or the mark, there's just so many different things that made these bottles unique. And eventually it got to a point where a man messaged me and said, when can I come? And at this point, I, I, my brain was exploding and I didn't know what else to do. I'm like, I, can't, I just had to get rid of these things. And I'm not going to do one bottle at a time because people were saying that's worth a dollar. I don't want to sell a dollar at a time. And, and so this guy offered to come, and uh, he drove three hours just to come see my bottle collection. And he, he shows up, and he's bringing a, a uh, Sprinter van, very nice Sprinter van. This man was an antique collector, and he knew everything there was to know about bottles. And when he walked into the room, he started picking them up, and he quickly was putting one to the side and another. And he, he started grabbing them and moving them around, and I had an amazing bottle collection. But I didn't know what to do with them. And, and, and I didn't value them like he did because he's been in the industry for years and he'll buy them and resell them. And he, he understood the value of these bottles. And it was just so weird to me. And so he offered to buy them as a bulk. And that helped me a lot. Uh, because I did not want to sell individual bottles. Uh, even though I did try to post on Facebook Marketplace and things like that. Nobody wants them. What would happen is, if somebody doesn't value them, what do you think they would do? They, they would crush them. They would, they would just throw them in the trash. These bottles are worthless to probably 99% of us. Do we have any bottle collectors here? Yeah, we've got a few. We've got a few. There are some neat bottles, but most of us could care less. And so this man would take them all off, and, and, and he valued those bottles so much, I don't know what he did with them. Maybe he did resell them. He probably got a great deal, but the church made some money, and the youth kids got to go to NAYC and uh, North American Youth Congress. They got to go travel. They used that money for something great. But there's an exchange that happened there where one person saw the value that I did not see. And it's pretty crazy. And so this exchange happens many times. Like I said, you did it today just to come into this place. And uh, whether relationally, you make exchanges. Anybody have wedding vows or exchanged vows? A few of you have. Uh, but if you see value in the exchange, then you will be faithful, right? If you don't see value in the exchange, you will not be faithful. Uh, business partners make an agreement because they have an exchange, an agreement that they are going to abide by a certain rule because they see value in the business that they are investing in. Teachers, any teachers, they give out, you give out a syllabus to your students because you see value in just following with the syllabus. Sister Irma, you agree? Yeah? It's good to have that. Keeps you on track, keeps you going, keeps the class motivated. It's a little strategic, but you agree on the syllabus. And so the give and take process happens moment by moment by moment. We make these choices day by day almost without thinking about it. And some of you that are more disciplined, wake up early, 5 o'clock, pastor. Maybe it's not because of discipline, just getting old maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but we get to the point where we make these choices and they don't even really become choices. And there's exchanges that happen over and over again. We see this example of exchanges happen verbally and relationally in the Bible. We see the example of Noah. Uh, we had the opportunity to go into Noah's ark. Uh, the recreated one, of course, uh, in Kentucky this past summer. It was huge. It was amazing. It was 
what they assume Noah would have built. And it was crazy. Anybody ever been there? Noah's Ark. It was just mind-blowing, the size of the ark. So Noah, his life is disrupted, to be honest. He's disrupted because he's living as a righteous man in an unrighteous world, and he's trying to raise his family right, and he's doing everything that he knows to do. And he had evenings off, maybe. He worked to provide for his family. He had all these things going, and then suddenly God speaks to him. Don't you just hate that? God disrupts his life and and puts a call on his life. And he tells him, you're going to save your family and humanity because of the relationship that you have with me. In a pagan world, Noah has an opportunity to stand up and and continue his righteousness and build an ark. Anybody ever had a passion project that kept you up at night? I, I know Isaac's a good example of that. I've done those. And, 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 and your wife is telling you, you know what, you need to go to sleep. You don't need to be doing this. Noah has this passion project that's thrown upon him, and he's relentlessly building. And he's working to the specifications that God has given him. And so Genesis chapter 6, verse 18 says, But with thee I will establish my covenant. This exchange that's happening right here. I'm going to establish a covenant And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and the wife and thy sons' wives with thee. I'm going to skip to chapter 6, verse 22. Thus did Noah. So he he agrees to the conditions of the exchange. And he obeys God and says, I'm going to do what you asked me to do. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. So Noah gives of his time, adds all this burden on top of his normal requirements as a father, as a grandfather, as a dad, to do what has to be done to save humanity. He's a real hero. A real hero. And then we see the Noahic covenant in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Verse 2, And the fear of you... And the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. Any hunters, fishermen? Wouldn't it make you feel good to God say, yeah, the the animals will fear you. When you go out to hunt, it actually says that uh, they will be delivered into your hands. That's pretty good. Uh, If you've ever seen any of those shows where you have to survive and you're alone in the wilderness and they're shooting darts or, or shooting bow and arrows or hitting them with a club, things like that, it takes you back a little bit. But Noah is promised that you're going to be the feared of all the animals and uh, the fowl of the air and all, all that move on the earth upon the fishes of the sea into your hands they will be delivered. He's the greatest hunter ever and he's obeying God and God gives this symbol that we have misused in our modern age but is a promise. This covenant, this exchange that you obeyed God and now I will never flood the earth again. A rainbow appears and he says this belongs to you and not anybody else. This is for humanity to understand that I'm not going to destroy it with water. He will say there will be fire in the end, but he says that I will never flood the earth again. And he makes this promise and it represents his grace and it represents his love for humanity and the exchange that took place of one man saying, I will save my family. I will stand up and I, I will do the right thing in a wrong world and I'll, I'll do what's necessary. A rainbow would appear. Another man by the name of Abraham. Quite different. Not a, a righteous man living in a pagan world, but Abraham worshipped other gods, Scripture tells us. So you're, you're telling me he's not following the one true God? He's, he's not... Uh, listening to the God that created the heavens and the earth, but he's worshiping other gods, that would be considered a pagan. So he has this different perspective, and it, it's quite, it, it's, it's weird, it's just different. The scene is not of a righteous man, but he's, he's a pagan, and he's getting old, and his wife is barren, and they're at this place, genealogy, in their genealogy, where it's a dead end street. You read Genesis, and you see that they, they read this genealogy, and it gets to Abraham, and they're not going to have any kids. He's a pagan. He's followed his, his father out of Ur and into Haran. And, and they were supposed to go to Canaan, but they didn't quite make it there. And they just settled for something less. God wanted them to go to Canaan, but they're not going to do it. They're just going to sit there. And so God calls Abraham to go further. Do what his dad never would do. And, and to step out and get away from the other gods. And, and to shake up life a little bit. Because what else do you have to lose? Your genealogy is pretty much ended. 
we see that they worshipped other gods in Joshua 24. Uh, he, ha he has this future that, that seems pretty dark. No other options, nothing else to do. Uh, but it, it, I can't say this was an easy choice because he's with his family. And at this point in time, leaving your family is forbidden. It, it, it's scandalous to, to walk out on your family and just move after what God tells you to do. It, it's unheard of. You're denying your family. You're going you're to walk away from your father and your mother and, and you're going to go after God's calling. That's crazy. And so Noah, excuse me, Abraham has no foreseeable future. No human power can invent a future for him. Nothing can happen other than you either take care of your father or mother. They're aging. You are aging yourself. His, his dad died at just over 200 years old. That's pretty old. And so he, he can look after them, uh, but he himself is about 75 years old, and he has this option to stay there, take care of them, maybe manage their, their health and maybe their wealth eventually. But in the end, you have no generation to follow you. So God speaks to him in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. There's an exchange that takes place, a little different, but, but similar to Noah. Noah makes an exchange, saves his family. Abraham makes an exchange and gains a family. It's amazing how God has this miraculous power to, to develop and, and bring something that is as barren and bring it to life. And so Genesis 12 and 1 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you. There's no plan of action. There's no, there's no uh, map that he's going to have to follow. There's, there's nothing. In this first scripture we see, he's just saying, get out. He's saying, leave. He, there's no hope where you're at. Uh, you're on a dead end, so you've got to move. Like I said, not an easy choice, but he makes a choice and says, all right, I'm going to move forward. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And I will make thee a great nation. The exchange is this. You get out, and there's opportunity for your family, for yourself, and the world. He said, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So God makes this promise to Abraham. You leave your nation, leave your identity, leave what you thought was blessings. Because you know, he had to have some blessings, some belongings, something that he's like, oh, this is pretty cool. It may be from one of the other gods that he's serving. But at this point, the one true God comes to Abraham and he says, I am going to make your name great. You're going to have a new identity that's not dependent on your father that failed. Your father had these plans of, of going to Canaan. Your father was going to do this great thing, but he didn't. He settled. And now it's you. You're no longer going to ride on your parents' coattails. You're no longer going to just follow along and get old with them. But he's saying, your name will be great. I'm going to make a nation with you and you'll be blessed. It's pretty amazing, the opportunity, this exchange that money could not, you, you, could not, you could not put a value on what God is offering at this point. Something that goes generationally from time after time after time over the years after you die, you may not see the blessing. You may not experience it. You may not hear your name being called as a great name. But generationally, God is working and He's moving. Yeah. So Abraham's covenant is, is fulfilled as he takes these steps of faith and a great nation is, is, is made, but he never really sees it. And his name is made great, but he never hears it. And the world is blessed because of an exchange that he accepted. There's a challenge that, 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 that could not be valued and he saw it kind of like that, that police chief who said, I can invest in Bitcoin when no one else sees the value. Abraham said, you know what? <laughs> what else am I going to do? What, what, should I just settle here in Haran? Should I move forward? What should I do? So, this life of faith that we see continues. And we, we see this in Hebrews 11. It speaks so clearly of what happens with Abraham and the blessings of Abraham. It speaks in verse, 11, uh, verse 8 of chapter 11. It says, by faith... Everyone say faith. faith. <clears throat> Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have received for an inheritance, obeyed. And when he went out, not knowing whither he went by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and their heirs with him of the same promise. 
For he looked for a city which, which hath foundations, whose builders and maker were God. So he's looking beyond himself. That's a pretty hard thing to imagine in our day and age where all we think about is my retirement, my uh, 401k, my paycheck next, this, this coming week, and all the things that I count as my own. And, and we bring these things in, and we're not willing to give some things up. There's some things that we count so valuable, but we misjudge. So Abraham is willing to look beyond himself and look beyond time itself. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. They, they judged God as being a faithful God. The song we just sang at the end of this worship time was that he's faithful and I can worship him because he is faithful and he's never left me and he's, he's always here for me. He's always taking care of me. And so Sarah judged God as a faithful God, not as a God of harsh wrath that's going to take you down at every moment, but instead she sees him as a God that can work miracles and move beyond her limitations as a human. Therefore, sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and the multitude as the sand of the sea, uh, which the sheesore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promise. They, they died in faith. They knew they were making a choice, making an exchange, but it wasn't necessarily for them. I respect somebody that has a retirement, but it also gives an inheritance. The scripture tells us a man that gives an inheritance to their family as a wise man. But he, he counted himself as a pilgrim, strangers to the earth, and they're looking for what verse 16 says is a better country, that is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared them a city. So this relational exchange was mutual, both in Noah and in Abraham. We see this exchange of, I will obey you, I will follow you, whenever you speak to me, I will obey and God was faithful, believe it or not. Between Abraham and God, Sarah and God, Noah and God, He was faithful and He was good. From Abraham forward, we see them moving into Egypt and we see this process of time go uh, forward and, and, and we see the life of Moses and we just go through the New Testament where the law, the Old Testament, excuse me, when the law is presented to the people of God and, and they're given this law and we're brought into the New Testament. Hundreds of years have passed. And when men called on the name of the Lord in Noah's time, hundreds of years passed, Abraham calls on the name of the Lord. There are men that are faithful. And, and their lineage has began. And, and God's people become a little wishy-washy over time. We see Paul confronting the church. And he, he speaks in Galatians chapter 3. In verse 24, Wherefore the law was a schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So there's reason for this process of time and teaching that takes place over time. Have you learned anything over time? Oh, yeah. Has your value system changed over time? There's some things that we value as, as a child. My daughter, she sees more value in her stuffed animals than a $100 bill. If I remove a stuffed animal without her knowing, she knows that the moment she gets in her bed. It's the truth. It's the craziest thing. I would never know these things. But a child will value something completely different than an adult. And so we have been taught and brought into this understanding by the law that, that it's supposed to teach us and bring us to Christ. But after that, faith has come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in, in Christ Jesus. He's saying we have got to learn. We have got to learn. We have got to mature. We have to develop. The scripture uses the word perfecting. And we're all in that process. We should be. In, in, in the eyes of God, we have got to get to the point where we're willing to perfect ourselves. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is no bond or free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we see this process of time that Abraham impacted you and I. No, no Greek or Jew, no, no man or woman. We have this unity in the faith that if we are baptized 
in His name, if we are brought together as a body of Christ that works together daily, I, I pray for you, I, I, I help you, I do it from Abraham's seed forward. Yep. Jesus, in the lineage of Abraham, stands out and it breaks down the barriers. The Judaizers were hoping that they could just put some more laws on you and make sure that you can just keep obeying by the Mosaic law. and all. But he's saying that was just a schoolmaster. That was something to make us mature. That was something to make our value system change. What is sin? It's, it's established. We understand sin by the Old Testament. We understand what God hates. We see what God loves. We see, oh, we, we see everything, the characteristics of God in the Old Testament. And so there's this great exchange that has taken place day after day, whether it was Abraham with a dead end, not producing, they're not going to have any children, not going to have any opportunity in the future. Noah, he could have just sat there, could have just not obeyed. But today I speak to a church that maybe, maybe some of you feel barren. Maybe, maybe someone in here today feels as if, I have no future, I have no hope, my children are not living for God, uh, maybe, maybe I'm not living for God, I'm just here and I have a hard time singing these songs because I, I, I want to experience it, but I, I, I'm a little reluctant and ashamed of what God might say if He saw my sin. But today, I, I bring back the illustration of the man that saw value in a bottle. He, he, he shows up and he drives three hours out of his way and he sees these bottles that he, he saw at a distance and he wants to inspect them personally. And he's willing to load them up in his truck because he saw everything about them. He could pick it up and he sees the, the markings on it. Every crack, everything where it was made, they can track these bottles, you know, to the plant it was manufactured in, where it traveled to after that. It's like a car with a VIN number almost. It's the craziest thing. But Jesus sees you as an empty vessel, maybe a full vessel, maybe one that needs to be empty. Maybe one that he can see all the way through it when no one else can. One that he knows, hey, you, you, uh, you tended yourself to hide what's going on. I think for some reason, we see through a glass darkly. One day we'll see him face to face and we'll understand what he sees in us. He, he, he knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows every detail about us. And He's willing to see value in you when no one else will. This marketplace of the world, much like Facebook or Craigslist, is open. And, and, and you're getting these messages from a preacher. You're getting these messages from a teacher this morning. And you're getting this message that God loves you and He has value in you. And He's willing to go out of His way to save you. Because yep, right. He doesn't want to see you end up in a landfill. or He doesn't want to see you destroyed. He doesn't want to see you undervalued. But He sees you yep, that's right. with all that you, you believe they're flaws. That's right. you, you believe that they're things that have, that have hurt you and harmed you. And you believe these things are going to follow you down your dead end track. But He sees value and potential. Right. Why don't we stand in this place right now? God... He, he come to earth in a manger, not, not as a conquering hero as, as many would expect, but he defied all odds and he comes out in a manger and he's a baby. He matures, he grows, and, and all of a sudden Mary sees him on a cross, dying, her own son. And why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you and I. He, 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 this promise that we see in the book of Acts where all these people are in Jerusalem. And they're wondering, what is going on? What is happening? This, they, they crucified this random person that they thought. They, they crucified him. Give us Barabbas. Move, move on forward. We're going to just let this guy go. I've seen the mob mentality in places. You probably notice it on the news. There's this mob mentality that takes place. and People get out of their minds and do things they would never do. But then instantly, they're, 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 they're pricked at their heart, and, and they're saying, men and brethren, what shall we do? I've sinned against God. I, 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 I filled myself up with myself. I filled myself up with, with disease and nasty stuff in this world that I've allowed into my home, and I've, I've allowed these things in. 
verse 36, Acts chapter 2 says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Suddenly there's this reevaluation of value of what was not just a human, but was God manifest in flesh. Suddenly there's, there's this guilt of sin that, that's come upon them that I've sinned against God. And, and they're pricked in their hearts and they don't know what to do. And they, they come to this realization, this maturity aspect of we just did something really wrong. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? How can we rectify this oversight? How can we fix this problem that we have created? And, and we didn't expect it. We, many of these people were Jews. They were the ones that were looking for the Messiah. But they didn't expect it like that. So Peter, Peter, the one that has the keys of the, keys of the kingdom, the one in Matthew chapter 16 that, that Jesus says, upon this rock I'm going to build my church. Peter, the one who, when he speaks, it, it, Jesus told him to. God, Jesus brought him to this moment and he, and he stands up and he says, and Peter said to them, repent as, as a bottle that's, that's been filled with, just imagine the, the nastiest thing you could think of. That, that's been my, I can imagine going out to a sand pile and just filling up a vase that was worth a million dollars. For me, it was Hot Wheels when I was a kid. And my sister took the Hot Wheels and put them in the dirt, buried them. <laughs> they belonged on my wall. And, and I can imagine this, 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 this priceless, most valuable possession, this vessel is dirty. And so Peter says, let's start with repentance. Let's start with the emptying this stuff that's inside of you. you. You brought it with you. You're here at this place. You feel regret. You, you feel shame. You, you, you don't know what else to do. But let's start with repentance. Step one, repent. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift the Holy Ghost. And so he tells them, empty yourself. I will wash you clean and I will fill you. It's, it's a simple, simple illustration. It's almost too simple. This vessel, this thing of value, you. Repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the great thing, much like Abraham and Noah, is this doesn't stop with you. This goes beyond you because the next verse says, For this promise is unto who? You? Your children. And to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's not going to be something that we bring into a holy huddle and say, This is for us. This is for us. But it's for those outside of us. It's for those that are hurting, that, that are also filled with the world. But they have these identifying markers that God says, I see value on you when you don't see it yourself. I see your pain. I see your suffering. I see everything that you brought in this place with you. And I want to wash you clean. Verse 40, and with many other words did they testify and exhort, saying, save yourself from this untoward generation. There is a future, Scripture says, that it says untoward. It's untoward. We, we're living in a world that, 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 that's full of, of shame and guilt, that, that's problem-ridden, and it's, it's eating away like a cancer to the body. But it says, save yourself. Abraham had to step away from his parents and say, I'm going to go on to Canaan. And they may not have done it. I may have associated and identified myself with, with my father. I, may, I could stay in Haran. I can, I can stay with what this religiosity I've had in the past. And I can say I've been a Catholic because my parents and grandparents were Catholics. Or, or maybe I was this or that. And, and you can fill in the blank. But at some point, save yourself from this untoward generation. Peter delivers the keys to the kingdom. This comforter, this opportunity, this, this bottle buyer has arrived in this place. And he walks into the room, and he, he, maybe he didn't drive a sprinter van, but he walks into the room, 
And he sees soul after soul, vessel after vessel, standing in lines against the wall or in the, in the room. And he's, he's seeing them and he's seeing what no one else has seen. What the world has tried to use and abuse, he sees value. When the world has worn you out to where you feel like you're worth absolutely nothing, he sees a future. That's not barren, not, not with a dead end, but he sees a future where generation after generation can come forward. And it's not just here because Abraham looked to a city whose builder and maker was God. We have a heavenly reward. We have a heavenly reward. Today, I, I, I present this simple, simple exchange that if you will, he will. If you will take the call that God has put on your life and and it starts with, God, empty me. God, I I know I'm full of all this junk and I've brought it into my home and I've brought it into my life and and God, I'm, I'm tired. I'm weak. I need peace. Let's start with repentance. If you've not been filled with the Holy Ghost, this is your opportunity today to come forward and say, God, I want to find some time alone with you. I'm going to repent. And if I haven't been baptized, I want to be baptized. I want to be washed clean. The baptistry is warm. But it doesn't stop there. Abraham, Noah, all, all the, 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 the people of faith walked in faith. And they took upon themselves the power that God offers. The Holy Ghost is for us. It's not just for you and your home, but it's for your family and your generations to follow. If you have been one of those that maybe you initiated this process and, and, and Abraham, think about it. Abraham went to Canaan, goes into a pagan land. He, he was a pagan. Now he's following God. He goes into a pagan land. And what does he do? He builds an altar. He gets to Shechem. And he, he gets to these places where he, he builds an altar to the place that God promised to him. He hasn't yet taken it. He hasn't yet made sure his family has grown to millions where where it's innumerable. But he said, I'm going to build an altar out of faith. For those of you that have been filled with the Holy Ghost, maybe it's time to build an altar. God has promised this, this promise for you and for the generations to follow, all that are far off. But it takes us stepping forward today and saying, I'm going to build an altar at these steps. I know we call this an altar so often, but it's because it is. It's what you make it. Your altar can be at your pew right now. Your altar can be in your home tonight. Your altar can be right now. So I want us to pray. If you feel God tugging you, moving you, come forward. If God is speaking to you and he sees you as the vessel that you are, not the vessel that you've tried to portray, but the vessel that you are, and God, just as Peter Here's the men coming to him. I'm pricked at our hearts. Men and brethren, what should I do? Repent. Turn from your wicked ways. And and God, I'm never going back. God, I'm ashamed of what I've made myself. Take my sin. Cast it as far as the east is from the west. Remove me from that. God, if you can... Bring, bring children from Sarah. If you can do miracles like you have in the past, you can do it here today. God, if you can work in my life, do it here today. I don't want to wait another moment. I don't want to wait until I go somewhere else. But God, speak to me today.